Well, good morning, everyone. Great to be with you this morning, everyone in this room, everyone watching online, Steiner Ranch. Uh, Lord, we're, we're really excited about what God has to say to us today, and man, it's just great. Creekmore kind of was fairly gentle. That was nice of him. When are you going to sit through this again? Are you? Well, I guess they pay you to do that. So Tim, you know, uh, as he said, uh, Tim was here about a year, and then a year later they hired me, and it was just the two of us for a while. We, you know, right, right about the time that Noah came off the ark, that's when we got started together and kind of grew up in the ministry, learned so much from him and learned so much from you, and just so glad to be here with you. I want to begin uh, this morning with getting you to think about a statement. I really love the statement, and I want you to think about it with me. And it says that there are moments in time that set into motion a course of events that forever change the lives of many. Okay, I bet you can think of some moments of time in your own life, but uh, th this is true. There are moments in time. And they set into motion a course of events that forever change the lives of many. And, you know, I can think about one of those moments. As Eric said, it was a moment that took place right here on this platform about almost 23 years ago. And I was standing here, and my wife Kathy, we were, we were standing here with about 100 other people that you guys were sending out to go plant a church in Pflugerville. And it was December 1999, Y2K. You remember that? world was going to end. We thought, wow, what a great time to start a church. And so you guys sent us out. You sent me out with this Bible in our own pulpit that someone in our church here had made. And, and, and it seems like there was a center aisle here, but I don't know. I know we have new chairs in here, but anyway, we walked out and uh, uh, carrying a podium, the Bible, and, and we went off and we, we started that, that church. And I can remember before you sent us out, we had only been in this building for about three weeks, if I recall. It, not very long at all. Robert Lewis had come. Uh, some of you were, were around. You can remember Robert Lewis, uh, one of Tim's mentors, uh, created the material biblical manhood. Robert Lewis came and he did the message that day for dedication Sunday of the building. And he talked about your, your, your commitment and your love and your sacrifice in order to get this home for ministry built. And he talked about what happens when we gather together and people grow in their knowledge of God's word. And anyway, he was talking about that. And then he got to the end and I'll never forget what he said. Some of you, I bet, can remember. He said, now, get out. Get out. And what he was saying was reflecting that value that what's really significant in a church is not just how many people can we gather, but how many people can we scatter? How many people can you send out? And you guys, you've been scattering people in churches for decades now. Do you know that? That's who you are. That's the heritage that I received that the people that you sent out to go plant flu, that's the, the heritage that we received and we're trying to reproduce there. That's who you guys are. That's the heritage. And you know, when, when we think about y'all, I say, okay, uh, we, got, we, we got that heritage from you. Where did you get it? Well, actually, both of us, whether Pflugerville or all the churches in our association, <clears throat> we all look back not just 22 years, but really closer to 2,022 years. And our roots are found there. That there we, we see that God, when he launched the church, he set into motion a, a, a pattern that, that we find so instructive. And I want us today to kind of revisit the roots of the heritage that you're passing on. Some people have said, hey, you know, if you ever... If you ever lose your way, if you're ever feeling lost and not sure, that one of the things that you can do is just revisit where you came from. Like, how, what, what has God done? What, what got hold of you? And today, that's what we're going to do. I want to invite you to turn with me to the New Testament book of Colossians. I want you to go to chapter one. And that's where we're going to 
uh, start today. We're going to take all of our uh, uh, time looking at different places in the book of Colossians. And so that's where we're going to be. But we're going to start in chapter one, uh, verse 28, and I invite you to turn there with me. So uh, we're going to look, uh, first of all, at what I just call gospel saturation in the city of Colossae, uh, gospel saturation. And uh, uh, well, before we're through this morning, we'll look at gospel saturation in Colossae. We'll look at geographic saturation around Colossae. And then finally, we're going to look at God's saturation in the Colossians themselves. And so that gives you a little kind of preview of where we're going. And so we're starting first, as you see here, with gospel saturation in Colossae. And I want to direct your attention to verse 28, okay? Chapter 1, verse 28. Uh, we proclaim him, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. Now, I just love this verse. It's one of my favorites. It's so instructive for us. In fact, let's just do a little bit of Bible study, okay, just, just for a moment. Let's make some observations here. The first thing I want you to consider is what I just call the voice of saturation. The voice of saturation. All right, so when you look at these words, these underline, look at, look at them. We, we, we proclaim him. We, we admonish. Uh, that, that's a word that can mean to warn to admonish. Hey, there's a real heaven. There's a real hell. Uh, we proclaim him. We admonish. Uh, we teach. Okay. All, all really verbal words, right? The, the voice of saturation. Now we all know that as we try to influence our city, that uh, we do so with good works uh, to kind of capture their attention, followed by good words, the, the gospel, the good news, that it's both demonstration of the gospel and declaration of the gospel. Like these, these words, the voice of saturation reminds us that it's a vocal thing. The second thing in our little Bible study here is not only the voice of saturation, but what I would call the view of saturation. Because now we look at a phrase that actually begins, so that we may present, so that we may present. When you see the word so that, that, that's introducing purpose. It's introducing um, in order that. Uh, it, it's, in, it's introducing uh, in the view to, with the view to. And, and, and what we see here is that the reason why we're, we're proclaiming and we're admonishing, that we're teaching, is with a view to presenting, okay? Present everyone that there's a presentation to be made. Now, many of you professionally, you, you, you do presentations, right? You present in a classroom, you present at work, you make a sales pitch. Uh, you're, you're used to giving presentations. And, and of course, when, when you think about that, you're, you're always thinking, okay, what's my audience? Like, what do I know about my audience that I'm presenting to, that I'm pitching to? Well, who do you think the audience is gonna be for this presentation? Is it not gonna be Jesus Christ himself? You see, Paul here with that word really looks into the future. He's got a future view. When all of us as followers of Jesus Christ are going to have the opportunity to say, Lord Jesus, here's, here are the people that I invested my life into. Here's my family. And here's my neighbors. Here's my extended family. Here are work associates. Like, we're, we're going to make a presentation with a view to the presentation. And what do we want to present? Well, we want to present everyone perfect in Christ. Now, it's probably best to understand the word perfect in this context as the word mature. It's the idea of reaching an end, of, of reaching maturity, of reaching Christ-likeness. And that's really important, isn't it? Like we, we gather here, you're here today, your children, your students, like we, we gather because we're, we're discipling people, we're helping people grow spiritually to grow in their knowledge of God's word, like that's really, really important. In fact, I love what Bible teacher Jen Wilkins says. She says, the heart cannot love what the mind does not know. The heart cannot love, we're called to love the Lord God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. But the heart cannot love what the mind does not know. We've got to grow in our knowledge of God's word. We're trying to, 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 to move people toward maturity. 
And so the, the view of saturation is one that looks forward to the future to present and to present people as mature. But we're not through yet. There's another thing in our little Bible study here. This is what we just call the vision of uh, saturation. Uh, you see, he, he talks about warning everyone and teaching everyone uh, that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. Now, if you're looking at the NIV, you'll only find everyone uh, twice, uh, probably trying to smooth over what feels kind of like awkward repetition. But in other translations like the ESV, you see, don't you, this, this everyone Three times, everyone, 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 one verse, three repetitions. Now, if you wrote like that and submitted a paper to your English teacher, high school, your literature professor, she would write, awkward. It is awkward repetition. She'd probably write it in red. She'd underline it three times. Minus 10 points. Now, what is Paul doing here? Paul is an educated man. He's no stranger to style and rhetoric. And basically what he's doing is he's trying to say something. He's trying to scream something. That this is all inclusive. That this is comprehensive. That the vision of saturation, that's why we call it saturation, is because we want every man, woman, and child to have the opportunity to hear the gospel and believe. And so when he talks about saturation in Colossae, gospel saturation, it has this idea. It is everyone. Now, some churches, you know, they, they have full-time job, and it can be just completely consuming to just care for insiders. And what Paul says here is you better build into your insiders. You better mature them. But he says it's not just insiders. There are outsiders that we've got to reach. It's everyone. It's not just the ones that you've gotten. It's everyone. It's insiders and outsiders. In fact, he says as much in chapter 4. If we go to chapter 4, let me show you verse 5 and 6. He says, be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Now he's talking about evangelism. He's talking about living missionally. He says, be wise how you act toward outsiders. Outsiders here would be, you know, those who are outside of the church, but more importantly, they're outside of a relationship with Christ. Uh, be wise in the way you act toward them. Make the most of every opportunity. You hear what he's saying? There are moments in time that set into motion a course of I, there are moments, like steward your moments, steward your time. Uh, let your conversations be always full of grace and seasoned with salt so that you may know how to answer everyone. These aren't necessarily presentations. These are conversations. Oh, man, we can do a whole other couple of messages about that. But you see here he's talking about outsiders. This kind of leads us to our first takeaway this morning. As we think about our heritage, our heritage is a vision that is bigger than our church. That we have a vision that is bigger than our church. That's who you guys are. It's never been about our four and no more here. You guys have been sending people out. You've been scattering people. And what we need to remember, the heritage I received from you, the heritage you received from Christ is this is that we're always thinking, not either or, insiders, outsiders, but both and. I learned that from you. Greatly influenced by the pace that this church has set and going after people far away from God. When Kathy and I moved into the neighborhood where we are now, we really wanted to like build some friendships and and uh, got places in a really great, great, great location. And we got to know our neighbors. And one of those was a guy that lives behind us. We share a back fence. And his name's Jeff. And he's a great guy. And it was very obvious that he was the party guy in our circle of neighbors. And it seemed like almost every Friday the guy had a party. And uh, lot, lots of noise, a lot of activity, a lot of fun. 
And uh, one, one day he was out in his backyard and I kind of peeked over the back fence and like, you know, Mr. Wilson. And I said, uh, hey, um, uh, and we I, I introduced ourselves and I said, what, what do you got to do to get an invite to one of these parties that you throw? And so from that moment, you know, he, he started inviting us over and, and uh, we, we met through him, a lot of other neighbors. We just developed a great fun time and he had had some exposure in, to the gospel in high school, but he's been far away from God. And a couple of months ago, uh, he was sitting in my den with a health scare, waiting on results from the doctor. And he was ready to talk about God. I had a chance to share the gospel and pray with him. God's given us so many opportunities because let me tell you, as a pastor, you can be consumed with insiders and you better be building into them. See, we mature insiders to mobilize them for outsiders. You know, I talk to people in my church and they'll listen to me just because like I'm their pastor. I guess they feel obligated. <laughs> like, my neighbors don't extend the same courtesy. Let me tell you. In fact, knowing I'm a pastor, sometimes you feel it works against you. But God's given us so many opportunities just to be creative. Like I remember we did this up. Uh, one of these progressive dinners, right? You, you've done that before. And so we had kind of, uh, you know, appetizers and uh, 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 before dinner drinks. And we were at one house and then we went to a, another uh, neighbor and we had, you know, a, a meal and everybody's getting to show off their house. And, you know, people are, you know, getting to move around a lot. It was really a great, great event. And so then it ended up at our house. We were kind of the dessert and after dinner drinks. And so we're, we're, we're there at our house and I remember we have this uh, big kitchen, big island that spills out into our living room or den or whatever. And uh, uh, the, all the wives were in the kitchen and all the guys were out. And somehow we started talking about guns. And before I knew it, like all the guys were out the door. They go home and they get their favorite guns and like they bring them over to show to each other. And I'm, I'm like, like, what just happened? It feels like a gun show in here. And I, I, I just remember briefly look looking into the kitchen and locking eyes with Kathy. And there we, we just this subtle raising of the eyebrows and just like, what have we gotten ourselves into? Oh my goodness. This is what God has called us to. To mature insiders, to mobilize them for outsiders. It's both and. That we must continue with a vision, a heritage, a vision bigger than our church. Now, I want us to kind of move beyond just this, this idea of gospel saturation. I mean, every man, woman, child is the definition of saturation. And let's move to the idea of geographic saturation. Okay, so when we think about geographic saturation around Colossae, this emerges in a couple of different ways. And the first one is the idea of church planting, that saturation through church planting planting. Okay. Now I'm, in a minute, I'm going to show you like who planted this church. Now we all know that the apostle Paul planted a lot of churches, right? The Ephesians church, the Philippians, Thessalonians, the Bereans, the Corinthians. I mean, he planted churches all around the Northern rim of the Mediterranean, but not this church. He didn't plant this church. In fact, in chapter one, if you want to turn back there, uh, the, the chapter begins with just the power of the gospel that came to Colossae. And it talks about the impact of that. And then when you get to um, verse 7, we learn who brought the gospel. And so we read, uh, You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who was a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf. Uh, you learned it from Epaphras. The, the church planter was Epaphras. Now there's a name. If any of you are expecting, you're shopping for a good name, consider Epaphras. You can call him Pappy. And Epaphras is a stand-up guy. And so you think, well, where did this guy come from? And if you search your New Testament, you won't find him. Just mentioned twice here in the book of Colossians, here in chapter one, again in chapter four. And you ask the question, well, who is this guy? Now, I, I, I'm going to speculate. I don't think it's a very far uh, stretch. 
but we don't have this actually recorded, but it's very likely that Epaphras was trained under Paul. Uh, You may remember when Paul was in Ephesus, he planted that church and he had some initial success in evangelism. And then there was some, um, there there was some conflict and and, and there were some people that kind of, you know, pushed back against Paul. In fact, in Acts chapter 19, we read this, but some of them, that would be the the people of, of Ephesus, some of them became obstinate and they refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. And so Paul left them and he took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. Okay? Now, how long did he do that? Next verse says, this went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. Now, this is incredible to me. And so like all all the province of Asia, that's that's where Colossae is located, Asia Minor. And and it says here that like Paul lectured, he he did this thing. Now, now Creekmore, he's always talking to you about Saturate Austin Institute, isn't he? Trying to get you to go. I don't know if he's bribed you, but... Saturate Austin Institute. Well, here, what you've got is Saturate Asia Institute. You've got two years where Paul's teaching and he's training and he's sending people out. And Epaphras, our good friend, was probably trained and influenced during that time. And he goes back to the area where he grew up, kind of that that Colossae area. And sure enough, he comes and he plants the church. Church planting. Church planting is really difficult, but it's so effective. Some of you certainly know the name Tim Keller. Pastor, author, uh, leader of a, a multiplying church. Tim Keller says the vigorous continual planting of new congregations is the single most crucial strategy for the numerical growth of the body of Christ. Most effective strategy. Uh, A a number of different people have echoed that. Gurus about churches, church growth, Ed Stetzer. Church planting. So very effective, but so difficult. I have a son, I have a son, Jake, who's a church planter. Um, He's a a granddaughter plant of yours. It's planted through Pflugerville called Midtown Church down there on 45th and Red River. And Jake said something about how hard church planting is. And and, and Alex, we're not not trying to scare you away here, but brother. Listen to what he said. He says, if you want to learn how to more fully depend on God and live by faith, then plant a church. If you deeply desire for people to trust in Jesus and the gospel to be shared, then plant a church. If you want to partner with God to start something that can forever change the lives of many, then start a church. But if you want to be comfortable, if you want to feel like you're in control, if you crave stability and security, then do something else. Because it's hard. But God has a plan for some of you to be involved in church plants because that's who you are. That's your heritage. Like you you totally get that the vision has to be bigger than the church and broader than our community. You get that. And God's going to call some of you to go with a church plant team, a different part of the city. God's going to call some of you actually be a church planter, a leader, a pastor. Don't be surprised. Be open to it. That's who you are. That's your heritage. And so when we think about geographic saturation, we see the important role that church planting has. But that's not the only one. That there's something else as well. That geographic saturation is through church planting, but also through church partnerships. Through church partnerships. And I absolutely love this, that when we go back to chapter four of Colossians, we see that. 
We actually see the way that they would network and, and, and cooperate and work together. Let me, let me show you in chapter four. It says, Epaphras, and here's Pappy, who is one of you, he's probably from that area, he's one of you and a servant of Christ, Jesus, sends greetings. He's always wrestling in prayer for you that you may stand firm in all the will of God and mature and fully assured. Now he goes on. He says, I vouch for him that he is working hard for you and for those at Laodicea and Hierapolis. And there you go. Here, here's two other communities in his geography. Now, now Epaphras at, at the moment, at the time of writing, is probably with Paul. Paul's in prison, most likely in Rome, possibly in Ephesus. But it's one of his, past, uh, his prison epistles. And he's going to send this letter back to the Colossians through Epaphras. And he says here that he's working for, Colossian, for the Colossians and for those at Laodicea and Hierapolis. Now, that is incredible. We see more evidence of this partnership in the next few verses down. Where we read, after this letter has been read to you, see that it is also read in the church of the Laodiceans. And that you, in turn, read the letter from Laodicea. Like, wow, I, man, they, they, they've got a partnership going. Now, let, let me show you just ge geographically, since we're talking about geographic saturation, let me show this to you. And so this is really um, Asia Minor, which is present day Turkey. Uh, this uh, Lycus Valley uh, River, Lycus River Valley is probably about, you know, um, kind of just, just south of center, just west of center. Uh, all, all eyes are on Ukraine right now, right? And so Ukraine sits on the, on the Black Sea above it. And if you just go just directly south on the southern part of the Black Sea, you've, you find Turkey. And there, what was known as Asia Minor, kind of central and west, is this area. This is geography. And so Colossae and Laodicea, about 20 miles. Maybe just a little less than 20 miles. Same, same way to Hierapolis. Uh, Colossae to Hierapolis, uh, maybe 25, maybe 30. I think Austin to Georgetown. And what we have going on here, friends, is, is this cooperation, this partnering. Like they probably have the Association of River Valley Churches. Uh, there's probably, you know, a River Valley Bible Church, Colossae. In a River Valley Bible Church, Hierapolis. In a River Valley Bible Church in Laodicea. Like this is networking. These are churches working together for the geographic saturation around Colossae. Now, I don't know if I'm weird or what, but like that really jazzes me to see that. Because what you guys are doing is what they were doing. That's who you are. That's the heritage that you inherited and that you've been passing on. And God wants you to continue. God wants you to continue to be involved in that. To be goers. To be funders. To fund this. Uh, to be senders. He wants, he, he, he's calling you He's calling all of us to be involved in that. That's who you are. Well, I, I just love this. Now, as we transition again, the second tech away is simply this. That our heritage is a vision broader than our community, as we've said. That's what we draw from here. Our vision is, is one bigger than our church. It's broader than our community. But now we want to transition because we need some help. Uh, if you take this serious and you think about the challenges of church planting, you think, oh my goodness, how in the world could I do that? How in the world could God use me? That sounds like a lot of work and really difficult. And I want to take you back to chapter one as we consider uh, God's saturation for the Colossians. 
that the Colossians are saturated with God. And so remember verse 28, we looked at that together, right? That, that, hey, we're proclaiming, we're admonishing, we're teaching everyone, everyone, everyone. It's every man, woman, child. It's maturing insiders to mobilize for outsiders, like all that. And then he goes on in verse 29 and he says, uh, to this end, I labor, struggling. Now, this kind of sounds like self-effort. And it, it, it can be uniquely, it can be described that way. Because struggling and labor, let's just take, take the word labor. Labor is the idea of toil, of hard work. There's no way around that. This is sweat. <laughs> and then you get the word uh, struggling, which is a, a, a word where we get our word agony. It was sometimes used in, in athletic uh, contexts of how athletes, you know, would be straining at the finish line. Or maybe they're, they're lifting weights and they're trying to set a record and there's another, you know, 10 pounds added. And they're, I mean, they're pushing, they're straining. These guys that run long distances, which I think is completely unnatural. <laughs> Let me tell you, Jesus, as far as we know, Jesus never ran. That's why I don't. I just really want to be like Jesus. He didn't run, I don't run. But you've been in some kind of context where just struggling, just straining, that's the word here. And so we do see this sense of, of our active participation, what we would call self-effort. Now, we all know already, don't we, that, hey, self-effort alone is never going to get this job done. And so we love it that he continues and he says, to this end I labor, struggling with all his energy, which so powerfully works in me. Now, again, this is a great phrase here. He says, in other words, I'm laboring, I'm struggling, I'm, act, like, I'm doing that, but I'm doing it with his energy, uh, which so powerfully works in me. Now, Paul, again, uses repetition, this word uh, for energy. It's, it's actually, the Greek sounds very close to our word for energy. And he says, I labor, and I do this with all his energy, which so powerfully energizes me uses the word twice. Second time it's translated, works in me. It's his power. He's powerfully energizing me to do this. That, that's the idea here. And so we said, okay, a self-effort is, is like diligence. Spirit energy is like dependence. It's both of these things. It's not either or. It's like Francis Schaeffer used to, what he used to call active passivism. There's a, there's a part that we actively participate in, but then there's, there, there, there's something that's passive because work is being done from outside. Work is being done from an outer source. It's God. It's diligence and dependence. It's both and. So this kind of leads us to our, our, our third takeaway. that our heritage is a vision beyond our capacity. It's beyond what we have capacity to do on our own. When, when we try to do that, there's a couple of easy indicators, right? Sometimes what we call burnout, uh, prayerlessness. Those are all indicators that you're just relying on self-effort. But it's self-ever, it's diligence done with dependence. Because this vision is huge. To saturate, it's got to be bigger than the church, it's broader than the, our community, and it's beyond our capacity. <laughs> I remember when my two boys, Jake and Ben, were young and taking them camping, and we would go out and uh, get in a canoe and I know many of you have done this. And get them in the canoe, and they're, they're young, and they're in the front of the canoe, and you know, you're going to set a, a destiny. We're going to try to get across the lake, and you put an oar in each of their 
each of their hands and they can barely with their life jacket kind of, you know, reach over the side of the canoe. And, but man, they're, they're active. They're diligent. I mean, they're, they're, they're splashing. There's activity. There's water everywhere. Uh, they're dropping the oar. You know, you have to fish it. Like there's a lot of different activity. They're trying to go. But in the back of the canoe, dad, I mean, just consider this upper, this upper physical strength. It's impressive, isn't it, Eric? And dad's in the back, and man, I'm, I'm just digging. I'm just digging in. You know, I'm, I'm propelling this thing forward. And I'm doing mid-course adjustments. And, you know, we're tacking, and like, we're, we're, we're making progress, and they're participating. And don't you feel so many times that that's the way ministry is? That, man, we're in the front, we're splashing our oar around, we're working it, we're doing what we can. There's a lot of activity, a lot of diligence, but it is the Spirit of God that moves forward over and over again. God says, I will accomplish my purposes through the activity of people. God says, look, it's on me. That in my providence, I am going to accomplish everything I set out to do through the activity of people. Flawed, frail. God just says, get your oar in the water. He just says, make some noise. He says, like, get involved. Like, partner with me. Like, do what you can because I'm going to move this thing forward, but I'm going to give you the great joy of participating. Oh, gosh, I love that. And you do too because that's who you are. Our heritage is a vision beyond our capacity. Well, <clears throat> earlier I was thinking about a, a time when I was at the University of Texas. I was a, in my last year and I was making my way home from class to our uh, dorm. And as I did so, I stopped into a little chapel to pray. And of course, uh, the University of Texas is a great spiritual bastion. I don't know if you knew that. But. So I stopped and I uh, was praying. I was praying about uh, proposing to Kathy and I really wanted to marry her. And, and I was wondering, like, God, is this the time? Could I ask her now? Do I have to wait till I graduate? I mean, it was December. I had a whole another semester to go, but I really wanted to move forward. And, and I just wasn't sure. And I'm praying about that. And then I asked God to do something. I said, God, here's something that would be incredibly surprising because it's never happened before. But when I walk back to my dorm, if Kathy is sitting there in her car, parked in front of my dorm, which she's never done before, then I'm going to take that as an okay from you to go ahead and propose to her. And I felt pretty safe in that. Like, I, I mean, that, that wasn't going to happen. And sure enough, I come out of the chapel, you know, I just turn, I walk past Jester, I get to pray there. Dorn, I couldn't believe it. There's that brown Buick Regal. Kathy's sitting there. And I thought, oh my goodness, God. And so I approached her, we talked, but I chickened out. <laughs> but it was only two or three days later. I called her and it was kind of late, like on like a Wednesday night. And I said, hey, I want to pick you up for a minute. And so I picked her up and, you know, um, uh, we drove to Bartholomew Park. We walked out there and I got on my knee in the sandbox and I asked her to marry me. And just so you know that miracles still happen, she said yes. <laughs> Last week, I was with a, a lot of our family. My, my second son turned 40 years old. And I know I don't look old enough to have a 40-year-old son. I know you're thinking that, but... Also, I have a 42-year-old son, even old, but for Ben, my middle son, he, he was celebrating his birthday, and we were at this big event place, play, and like all, all of my kids were there, Jake and his wife, Krista, and Ben and his wife, Jennifer, and Kaylee, my daughter, her husband, Sebastian, all their kids, eight grandkids, and then we had a lot of lifelong family friends who were there, and they were friends that Ben had gone to college with and gone to high school with, and uh, there were work associates, and like it was huge. The people gathered. And I thought about that moment in the chapel. There are moments in time that set into motion a course of events that forever changed the lives of many. 
He said, one day we're going to stand at a party. One day we're going to be in a gathering. And present are all those from Dripping Springs and South Austin and East Austin and uh, Northeast out toward Hutto and Round Rock and Cedar Park and Midtown and all these churches that have flown out of this place. And we're going to look at that and we're going to share the stories, everybody's moment. Because there are moments in time that set into motion a course of events that forever change the lives of many. And today is such a time. Because we're just about ready to commission a new church. In fact, I want to invite you to watch a video with me, a video that will uh, set up the uh, commission of El Camino. But it also celebrates a granddaughter plant as well. Uh, a, a Austin Bridge planted from the well, which was planted from you. We're going to celebrate that in this video, but we're also going to especially celebrate El Camino, the launching of it. A new granddaughter and a new daughter. Would you watch this video with me? Let's watch. In 1992, at an elder retreat, God spoke to the elders and told us that he wanted us to start planting churches. Now, we were a growing church and people were driving in from different areas and God just wanted us to start putting churches in the areas where people were coming from, which then grew into this vision of saturating greater Austin with the love of Jesus. The churches that we've planted have been planting churches and all together, we are prepared now to plant our 39th and our 40th church. Grew up in Colombia. We moved to the States in 98. We were involved in the church planting uh, in Houston in 2012. Um, it wasn't easy. And somebody tell us about this church in, in Austin that has a program for church planters. We started praying about it. Uh, we went online, we found the school, uh, and we decided and moved. It was the, the best move of our lives. We want to be a place where all Latino families come and they find Christ in their lives. They find friends, they find help, but they also find the Holy Spirit to transform their lives. We are honored to be part of saturating Greater Austin with the love of Christ, of how we say it, saturar Austin con el amor de Cristo. I am born and raised in Denver, Colorado, and uh, moved here in Austin, Texas, maybe about 10 years ago uh, with my wife. Um, and yeah, found uh, church planting um, in, in two years ago uh, through the well. So Juhan is awesome, and I love this man. And I think what they're doing at Bridge is really important because there are no churches in the domain right now. And the domain is this part of the city that everybody flocks to. And if you go there on a Sunday, on a Saturday, whatever, it's like there are literally thousands of people from all around Austin that kind of flock in, and yet there's no church that meets there. We launched the church in February 6th, uh, very excited. Uh, God just moved in crazy ways to get us into a place called the Archer Hotel. Being a multicultural, multi-ethnic church is something that I'm just very passionate about. And we just really want to model what heaven is going to look like. As God continues to work, and brings more and more people to our city. We feel like we're just getting started. We feel like God is calling us to plant more churches, to share our faith. And we are so excited about this next step and the ones to come because Jesus is worthy of being Lord of our city. So I, I mentioned that Danny Box planted the second church in our movement, and this is Alex and Erica, our 40th church in our movement. So <clears throat> get to network with a lot of churches around the country. There are very few 
that can say that they have planted 40 churches. God has really done something special in us and through us. And so we just want to praise him for that. And so thank you for being a part. Um, Flanked around us are the elders of Hill Country Bible Church who own this vision that it's not enough that we build a great church here in Northwest Austin, Cedar Park, but we are here to reach greater Austin. And so I've invited them to be here. They've spoken into Alex and Erica. They've overseen um, their development. And now they're going to pray for them as we launch them out. And so, Mr. Greg Meyer, would you? If you would, as one church, could we stand together for them, please? And if you feel so inclined to put your hand forward, that's fine. And just, just pray with me now, if you would. So, Father God, we thank you for this moment in time that will change the lives of many. March 20th, 2022. We thank you for Erica and Alex, their passion, their purpose, their mission, their love for you. Father, we just lift them up today. We pray that you would give them clear vision, wisdom, determination, perseverance, and boldness as they share the love of Christ with our community and the greater Austin area. Father, we just uh, we give this time to you. We commit them to you. And we call on your personal strength, mm. Lord, to fill them in this moment for this time. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, thank you. You can, you can stay standing. Um, if you are in all of our venues at Signer and uh, here at Lakeline, if you're on the prayer team, you can go ahead and make your way around the room. If you came in here this morning, wherever you are, and you needed someone to pray with, um, those folks would love to be able to connect with you and pray with you. And um, for those of you here at Lakeline, if you'd like to meet Eric and Alex, they're going to be in the Welcome Center after the service, along with some of our other leaders. Out at Steiner Ranch, we're going to be with you next week so you can connect with them personally. And uh, there's going to be folks in your Welcome Center as well to say hi and welcome you to our church. With that, thank you for being here. Glad you are a part and hope to see you again next Sunday.